everyone. Uh, I'm Carolyn Curran. I'm, as I mentioned before, I'm with NOAA, the National Ocean Service. We have a laboratory here in Beaufort where I work. I'm a marine ecologist. The talk I'm going to give you today is um, trying to give you some background to introduce this whole subject of living shorelines and talk about the ecology and biology of these systems, which is really un the underpinnings for the engineering approaches that, um, that this group is going to take. It was really interesting to hear all the backgrounds that we have um, in here this morning. And when I put this talk together, Rachel and I put this talk together, we, we weren't really sure where we should go with it. So it's, I'm going to try and do a lot of things this morning. Um, and we would appreciate feedback from you all on what works and what doesn't. Um, I'm going to try and give you a little bit about the basic biology of natural habitats. We're going to go into living shorelines specifically and try and talk about some of the physical settings and things that these things best occur in. Um, my co-author in this talk is Rachel Gitman, who's in the back. Rachel uh, was a graduate student in IMS, and we're going to present some of, some of the research that really supports, I think, the approach and the adaptation of this approach by the state regulatory um, group to try and uh, promote this approach for homeowners and property owners. All right. Here's the outlines I mentioned, just kind of a general background on the function and role of shoreline habitats. We're going to talk a little bit about what we understand about shoreline erosion. We're going to talk a little bit about why we want to go away from some of the traditional shoreline hardening approaches and embrace this shoreline, uh, this living shoreline approach instead. Uh, we're going to give you some specific examples of living shoreline installations, how they work, um, and talk a little bit about some of the limitations of this approach, where you can use them and where you can't. So the North Carolina coastal habitats that you're going to encounter along the shoreline include these. We have salt marshes in the upper intertidal, and then as you go down through the intertidal, you get into um, oyster reefs, um, sand flats and mud flats just off, can occur just offshore that, and then seagrasses or submerged aquatic vegetation are also described or below that. All of these habitats occur sometimes in a continuum, sometimes you'll find all of them together. Um, all of them can be part of a living shoreline approach. All of them have their own role in terms of both shoreline stabilization and some of the other ecosystem functions that we're going to talk about. So the benefits, the reasons, the, the things that these habitats provide and that we are so interested in having this living shoreline approach is because they do a lot of great things for us. I'm not sure how many of you have heard the term ecosystem services. But it's this idea that these habitats kind of just do these things that we value. So they provide fisheries habitat. They provide habitat for clams, shrimp, um, crabs. They provide really important nursery habitat for um, the larval fish that come in here and grow to adult fish. They provide shoreline stabilization functions. They hold that shoreline together. They can attenuate wave energy. They provide great um, opportunities for recreation. Some people just like to go out and look at them. They're aesthetically pleasing. And they also have these other functions in terms of water quality. They trap sediments. They process um, nutrients and can remove um, too much nitrogen from the system. Uh, we've talked a little bit about they can actually sequester carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and bury it in their sediments and so thus can help mitigate greenhouse gas accumulation in the atmosphere. So they do all these things. They just do them, but we value them. And so we call them ecosystem services that these habitats provide and that we gain when we incorporate these habitats into our, into our shorelines. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about salt marshes in particular and just make a couple of comments about their basic biology to kind of help um, understand how to incorporate this habitat into a shoreline stabilization approach. So salt marshes uh, occupy this, this intertidal, this elevation band, approximately between high tide and mean sea level. Um, they can grow a little bit deeper, especially along the shoreline, as we'll see. So the horizontal distance of that marsh is really going to depend on the slope of the shoreline and the tidal amplitude in terms of how far that marsh can extend. And, and the thing about uh, the marshes is there's only a few species that occur there. It's a tough environment in which to occupy. So there's not a lot of competition for trying to grow out there in the intertidal. So you're dominated by just a few species. The lower marsh is dominated by Spartina alterniflora, or smooth cord grass. And then as you get up closer to the high tide line, you get Spartina patens, or salt marsh hay. And we'll see these later on today when we go outside. 
And then as you get into the upper marsh, you get um, some other species, Salicornia virginica or pickleweed, um, Disticlus spicata. And then as you get in the higher or in the fresher parts of the estuary, you start seeing juncus or, or black needle rush. Very small changes in elevation on the order of several inches can dictate which species you get in that intertidal zone. Uh, a couple other points I wanted to make are that marshes can grow in a variety of sediments. A lot of the shoreline marshes are actually pretty sandy, and marshes can make it in that sandy sediment. Although, as many of you who've actually walked through a salt marsh, you know they tend to accumulate very fine sediments, can become very organic rich. But typically along the shoreline, we find a lot sandier sediments. One thing I always wanted to mention is in almost every, uh, scientists have been doing fertilizer ex experiments on marshes for 30 or 40 years, and I don't know of a single one where the marshes did not respond positively to a nitrogen addition and often an N and P addition. So just kind of something, just to, you know, there is a lot of science out there that when you're trying to put a marsh in, when you're trying to get a marsh going, um, fertilizer is probably going to be a, a good thing to add to that marsh. The other thing I just wanted to mention, when we think about how to plan your, your, your site and this issue of if you go across intertidal elevations, you have different species, there is a, a tool available on the, uh, on the NOAA uh, co-ops or tides and currents website called MapTite, which is kind of an ArcGIS tool that allows you to input the uh, distribution of the marsh as well as the elevation. You get a digital elevation model of your site and it'll kind of help you map that out. So we have these beautiful shoreline habitats that provide all these great services. And we also have people that want to occupy the shoreline because it's so beautiful. And so the real challenge here is to maintain these beautiful home settings and these beautiful waterfront properties and also maintain this really beautiful shoreline and very valuable shoreline habitat. And here you see a nice fringing marsh with an oyster reef in front of it. And so the goal is to try and figure out a way to have, to have both of these things um, occur together. So, it, so one of the things I want to point out when we see these fringing marshes is that a lot of the ecosystem services that I just mentioned, they happen primarily at the marsh edge. And so even a fairly narrow marsh, you don't need hundreds of meters of marsh to get a lot of these ecosystem services. A lot of them occur at the, it would, can occur within a very narrow 10, 20 meter wide marsh. For example, there have been a lot of research that's shown the, fr the fish and shrimp utilization of a marsh is primarily at the marsh edge. That's where you catch the most. That's where they, they tend to occupy the most. As I'll show you in a minute, wave attenuation happens at that marsh edge. 10 or 20 meters of marsh can be very effective. Sediment trapping happens primarily at the marsh edge. So let's talk a little bit about wave attenuation, especially in terms of shoreline attenuation this, or shoreline stabilization. This is one of the most important functions um, of, of, the, of the marsh. So this picture up here is from the marsh you'll see later today right on our island. And there's, as again, as I mentioned, there's been a lot of research to demonstrate this. About half of the incoming wave energy is reduced within the first 10 feet of the salt marsh. Salt marsh grows up into the water column. It's, it's um, you know, cylinders that are pretty woody, and they give with that wave, and they absorb a lot of that wave energy. You can get over 90% of the incoming wave attenuation in the first 20 meters of, of marsh. There's also a lot of research that demonstrates clearly that wave energy reduction increases with plant biomass. Makes sense, but there's a lot of data out there. As you increase above ground biomass, you increase that wave energy reduction. However, the one thing we have to think about is this relationship between the plant canopy height and the tide. So in the bottom graph, there's low tide. So there's the water column right there at the, at the base of the plant. And this is when you can get erosion. If you've got waves happening now, it's going to be scouring that beach right there in front of the marsh. As the tide comes in, now you've got a tide. Now you've got the water column up through the, through the marsh canopy. That's when it's most effective. It's really going to knock down the waves at this point. When, however, you get a storm surge or water level heights that are double the plant canopy height, at this point, that, that marsh is no longer attenuating that wave energy. It becomes a drag coefficient as the storm surge moves across the marsh, but it's not really attenuating wave, wave, wave energy at this point. 
So the other thing I mentioned that salt marshes do, as they attenuate that wave energy, it is reduce both turbulence and velocity of the water moving through the marsh, the sediment suspended in the water column falls out into the marsh. So marshes are really effective at trapping sediments out of the water column. And I've got here just some pictures that I don't know how well you can see them in this light of some of the tools that we use to measure this ability of marshes to trap sediments from the water column. So one of the things we use, and you might hear about, are uh, surface elevation tables or sets. And these are devices that we put on benchmarks, and then we have these rods down on the sediment surface that allow us to measure millimeter level changes in the marsh surface. And sea level rise every year is on the order of millimeters, so it's important for us to track millimeter level changes in that marsh surface to understand if that marsh is able to keep up with sea level rise. So that's one approach that measures net change in the marsh surface elevation. Another thing we can do is we can put down what we call horizon markers, which is a layer of bright white feldspar, which is a, like pottery clay. You put that on the sediment surface, it gets wet and it forms a really cohesive bright white layer, which you can then core and then you can go out and you can, with digital calipers here, you can measure how much sediment has actually been brought onto that marsh surface. The other thing we do, and I'll show you some data that we've um, obtained this way too, is, as I said, these are benchmarks that you survey in. You can put a, a GPS receiver on that benchmark, put a rover, in this case on a bicycle, and you can collect a lot of elevation points. And so you can get an idea of the whole site elevation change, whether or not that site is accumulating sediments or eroding. So using this variety of techniques, we and, we and others have shown that marshes do grow sediment volume over time, that storm events, particularly hurricanes, are often a source of sediment to the marsh rather than an erosion event, that marshes are able to keep up with sea level by this gradual accumulation of sediment on the, on the surface as well as their below ground production, and that this, that, and that this sediment increase, this increase in sediment volume, facilitates the carbon sequestration ability of salt marshes. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about shoreline erosion and some things we've learned about shoreline erosion, particularly in North Carolina. So here you see three shoreline habitats, sediment banks, salt marsh, and swamp forest. And they're all, you know, they're all going to erode. And they erode because of ambient wave energy, just the everyday lapping of that wave energy on the shoreline. Storm events, of course, can be a huge driver. But they Erosion is also um, exacerbated by some other things that can happen. For example, the disruption in sediment supply. Damming of uh, the nation's rivers has been demonstrated to be a huge problem for coastal salt marshes. We've removed the source of sediment that those marshes uh, use to, to build themselves up. Um, changes in shoreline topography by building, for example, um, can also increase shoreline erosion, removal of vegetation, obviously. Another big issue is boat wake, so proximity to navigation channels. The barges that go up and down the ICW and put those big waves up on the shoreline, that's a huge um, impact on some, of these, on some of the shorelines. So just talk a little bit about some of the studies that have been done in North Carolina. As I mentioned, erosion. So we can, we can try and figure out, you know, how well can we predict erosion at any one site? And that's kind of the first step of figuring out what to do about. And erosion is really a function of a number of things. First of all, the wave energy, which is a function of the fetch, which is the distance over which the, way the wind is blowing, the direction of the prevailing wind. So if that fetch lines up with the prevailing wind direction, it's a lot worse than if the fetch is counter to prevailing winds. The local bathymetry, the deeper the water, the higher waves you can stack up. And then, of course, the uh, kind of the outlier boat wakes. The geomorphology, the slope, the elevation, the sediment characteristics of the site can, can affect shoreline erosion rates, and of course a shoreline or vegetation type along that shoreline. Here's just a map of North Carolina. The colors on this map, the red is the land under less than one and a half meter in elevation. So you know you, we have a group here familiar with North Carolina. We know we've got a lot of low-lying land up here in the north with a lot of fetch. As you move down the coast, you get, here's the scarp somewhere in here, you start getting a little bit higher elevations and you get lower fetches. So the, here's just three studies that have been done looking at shoreline change rates on estuarine shorelines. Um, Stan Riggs and Dorothy Ames have a publication in 2003 that looked at that in the Albemarle Pamlico Sound, an overall average of about 0.8 meters a year up there. Um, Cowart and colleagues at ECU looked at the Noose River with a much less fetch and came up with an average of about 0.6 meters per year. 
And we recently looked at the New River Estuary, an even more confined system, and came up with an overall average of 0.3 meters per year. So overall, there is this general relationship between fetch and erosion rate. Well, what was interesting is within each of these studies, there wasn't really a good correlation between fetch or wave energy and the erosion rate. So there's other factors at play. And, one of the, and the main one is shoreline type. And what, what we have found in, both of these, in all of these studies is that sediment banks within any wave energy class are going to erode faster than a salt marsh. Um, and the salt marsh is going to erode a little bit faster than the swamp forest. This is a little bit misleading because the swamp forest is really only occurs in very low energy settings. Salt marshes occur across a surprisingly wide range of, ener of uh, wave energy settings. This is data from the New River Estuary. So we're trying some data out here because there's so many engineers in this crowd. So I'm putting up graphs. We're going to get past pictures. So you all can tell us if you say, no, nah, no, nah, you can not have to do that. But anyway, whoops. So here's, here's um, erosion rates for salt marsh in the blue, sediment banks in the red. This green bar is sediment banks that had a narrow band of salt marsh in front of it. And that's what this picture is here. So here's the sediment bank in the New River Estuary where you really get pretty high bluffs, a very narrow, and I'm talking like 8 to 10 feet wide of marsh. And we found significantly lower erosion rates associated with that narrow band of fringing marsh in front of that sediment bank. And then the, salt, the uh, swamp forest had the lowest erosion rates. So we do have some data to go on there. The other thing I think that have, is of real interest um, in, in this process is, well, what wave energy conditions can support a living shoreline approach? And how do we match our living shoreline design to the site wave energy conditions? So what I have here, as I mentioned, we, we find fringing salt marshes across a very broad wave of wind wave, a broad range of wind wave energy. This graph here is marsh width. So this is 100 meters wide marsh here. That's not right. I can't even read it. 700 meters wide. I was going to say 700 meters wide. So very wide marsh here at very low wave energy settings. There is a relationship between wave energy and how wide the marsh is. And, and as you get into higher wave energy, it's not surprising, you start seeing narrower marshes. But this gives us a clue as to the kind of the wave energy settings at which you could, you could put a marsh. We ran an exercise where we looked at existing stone sills. So this is one of the living shoreline approaches you're going to hear a lot about today. It's called a hybrid approach or a marsh sill approach where you put stone sill in front of that fringing salt marsh. And this graph shows you the wave energy settings of all the, way, the stone sill projects that have been put in. I think this was done about five years ago. And so a couple things came out of this. Surprisingly, a lot of these sills are put in places where maybe you didn't need them. Very low wave energy settings where we have very wide, broad marshes. So you, maybe you didn't need that sill. The other thing is some of these sills were put in really high wave energy settings. And I want to particularly, so I want to particularly point out this dotted line here. For those of you who are familiar with the dredge spoil island right off Harker's Island, on your way out Barden Inlet, there's a dredge spoil island over to your right as you're heading out. And in the 80s, um, a salt marsh was established on that dredge spoil island by Steve Broom and some folks here at this lab. And then uh, in the 90s, uh, Dave Meyer went out and put oyster culture in front of that marsh. This marsh has about a five mile fetch. It's way out here on this continuum of where we see salt marshes. And it's done great. This, is, this picture was taken right after um, Hurricane Irene and that combination of marsh Oyster reef, there's also seagrass beds and a shallow sand flat off of that has been very capable of maintaining that shoreline over the years. So this is kind of an outlier um, on this continuum of where you're going to find marshes, but also an example of this kind of system can work even in fairly high energy settings. So let's now talk about um, shoreline hardening and why some of the adverse impacts of shoreline hardening and why we're interested in going to towards a living shoreline approach. So this slide just shows you some of the approaches that have been used from seawalls um, to bulkheads uh, to uh, groins or jetties, riprap revetments, breakwaters have all been used. And they, and I just want to, and there has been a fair amount of work shown how these, I mean, you can just look at them and see there's not a lot of coastal habitat that we've just been talking 
associated with any of these structures. They don't coexist well with the maintenance of those coastal habitats. So what happens when you harden a structure? What do you lose? Well, this is that, you know, a cartoon version of what we'd like to see. We have the seagrass out here. We have the tidal marsh here. One of the most important points that I want to make about this, these natural systems is that just that shallow water in and of itself is really important. It's a refuge for those small larval juvenile fish to get away from the large predators. And so I think what's the statistic is 90% of the commercial fisheries in North Carolina are estuarine dependent. They spawn offshore. They come in as larval fish and they need, that's really the key part of their life cycle is getting from larvals to juveniles to adults. And what they need is just shallow water. And so this is maintained in this kind of condition is this shallow water refuge. When we harden the shoreline and we introduce a bulkhead, we lose our, we lose our vegetated intertidal. The waves are no longer absorbed by the marshes I mentioned earlier. Now they're hitting that bulkhead and they're bouncing back out and they're scouring that bottom. They're deepening that sediment. So we're losing that shallow water refuge and we're losing all the, the habitat value for fish of that shoreline. The other point is these bulkheads are put in at or above mean high water. That's the regulatory. You have to put it at mean high water or above. But these changes that are happening are all occurring below mean high water which is a public trust resource. So we're losing, that, that we're losing that ability to trap sediments. We're losing the vegetation. We're losing that fish habitat. We're losing some of the biogeochemistry that occurs in those marsh habitats because of the introduction of these bulkheads into this. Even though the bulkhead is put above the mean high water line, the loss of public trust resources is happening below the mean high water line. Another problem we have when we have um, the introduction of seawalls is this idea you might hear of coastal squeeze. And this is the idea that when you have, when you don't have any, when you have a low-lying land such as we have and you don't have any structures landward, the marshes transgress landward with sea level rise. So sea level's been rising gradually for the last several thousand years and marshes just kind of can gradually move landward without any obstructions. But with the introduction of seawalls, highways, buildings, we've kind of squo we've, we've, we've interrupted that process. And now the marsh doesn't have anywhere to go. It's eroding, it's being drowned on the, land, on the seaward side, and it's got nowhere to go on the landward side. So what can we do to try and mitigate both the loss of habitats by these shoreline hardening approaches I described and by this coastal squeeze function? So this is where We've come into the living, this idea of living shorelines. Here's another definition. I don't know if it's the same one um, Whitney used or not. There's, this is kind of an evolving idea of what living shorelines include. But basically, we want to include vegetation and or other soft elements, in, possibly in combination with a harder shoreline structure, maybe just an oyster reef, maybe, maybe a rock sill for added stability where you need it. We want to maintain that continuity of the natural land water continuum and reduce erosion for the property, the waterfront property owners, while providing habitat value. And I think this is a really important point, increasing resilience. These systems are more resilient in many cases than are the hardened shorelines. So we want to enhance coastal resiliency with this approach. So here we have um, our natural shoreline. We've mentioned when we harden the shoreline, we lose habitat in a lot of those ecosystem functions. How about living shoreline options? What can we do in terms of, here's some of the, uh, here's some of the options that can be used, everything from a, just natural habitats, a marsh and oyster reef, um, perhaps a marsh with a stone sill. Sometimes in some settings we see marshes with bulkheads, and then this is a much bigger approach for a high wave energy setting. So we've got this whole suite of things that fall under this definition of a living shoreline. And some of the questions that we have are, how effective are these living shorelines at providing those eco ecosystem services I described? How effective are they at maintaining the shoreline? Are they really good at preventing shoreline erosion? And are they going to maintain coastal resiliency? Can they keep up with sea level rise? So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the research um, we've done to answer some of those questions. First, talk a little bit about fish habitat. 
comparison of um, living shorelines and um, hardened structures. And this is um, a lot of, this is Rachel's dissertation research, and I think there's, you know, some of this is going to be on the website. She's had several publications, been really um, powerful demonstration of how effective these living shorelines are at providing fish habitat. So as I mentioned, there was the nice picture, then we put in the bulkhead, we lose, all those we lose all that habitat, and we found clearly that we don't get as many fish. When we don't have vegetation, we don't have structure, we don't have oyster reefs, you don't have as many fish offshore of a bulkhead system or on a flat bare sediment system as you do when you have marsh oysters SAV. When you get the SAV back into the system and or um, even the oysters or the, the rock sills, and then the marsh behind it, Rachel found as many fish um, as diverse, or in some way times more diversity in the living shorelines than the natural shorelines. So we found very quickly, within a year or two, as soon as you get the marsh established, you get a, a restoration of that fish habitat function with the living shoreline, whether you have oyster or whether you have rock. So Rachel's research showed that living shorelines can actually provide um, much better habitat for fish and, cr and crustaceans than a bulkheaded shoreline. And that's been clear here with bulkheads, and it's been demonstrated in the Chesapeake Bay and other places for riprap revetments as well. We've also found that sills can function similar to oyster reefs in terms of providing habitat for fish. So the rock sill is a hard substrate. A lot of times it's colonized by oysters, especially the granite and marl shells. Um, and you'll see that today too. The oysters will settle out on those, on those sills and actually become part reef, part stone sill. We've also found that it's really important to have that marsh plant, that marsh planting behind the sill. You can't just have the reef, you can't just have the marsh sill and get that fish habitat benefit. You have to have that marsh community associated with the sill to provide the same fish habitat value function. So what about erosion protection? Are these things going to work? So uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of data, some of which uh, Rachel got um, and some of which I got and associated with Hurricane Irene. So this is a picture of Hurricane Irene landing on our shore in 2011. And Rachel did a couple things. Rachel looked here in, um, in uh, Bogue Sound and also up in the northern part of the state. And again, this is another nice publication that will be on the website. And if you have questions, um, certainly talk to Rachel. She's, she's here today. And so what Rachel went and fortunately had data at some of these sites before the hurricane came and then visited them after the hurricane. And this is a picture from Bogue Sound where there was properties that were very near one another. I think there's a lot in between. And this was a bulkheaded site and then two lots away was someone that had just put in this living shoreline. You can see here a rock sill and they had just planted the marsh. This is pre-storm. This is post-storm. The water level got up over the bulkhead, scoured behind it, completely removed the bulkhead. Meanwhile, even this very fairly new, not quite established marsh and sill came through it just fine, no damage at all. Again, these systems are kind of set up for having water go over them and come back out. The bulkheads aren't set up for having water get up on top of them and then it scours behind it. They don't do so well when that water goes up over them. Similarly, um, here on the island, um, this is, so you're right here, this is Piver's Island. You're going to see a living shoreline site on this side, a stone sill site on this side. Um, so we did something kind of similar, before, did some before and after work. We used this same approach and we put down feldspar layers. We wanted to know is, are we going to lose our marshes? Are we going to get erosion and scour during this hurricane? Or are we actually going to get sediments brought into the marsh during the, during the storm? And that's what happened. We had sediments deposited on our, on our living shoreline sites. We had no damage to any of the marsh, no damage to any of the oyster reef. The only place we had erosion was behind the seawall and adjacent to the, big, to the big rock that we had put down where there was no vegetation. So the vegetation came through the storm fine. The hard structures didn't attenuate wave energy. They reflected wave energy, and so you had erosion. So we mentioned another, um, another value of, of, of marshes and, uh, is, is this idea of sediment trapping and bringing sediments into the site. So we also have a few examples of a few sites to, to illustrate um, how effective they are at trapping sediments. 
And this is a series of pictures from a site that we established at the end of uh, the Rachel Carson National Astro Research Reserve, also known as Carrot Island. So <laughs> this is just um, east of the, of the Taylor's Creek boat ramp. So all of you folks who ever go launch there in the Taylor's Creek boat ramp and head out to Shackleford, you're going to see this on the eastern end of the island. It's a really high energy site. Again, on that continuum I showed you, there's about a four or five mile per hour, uh, four or five mile uh, fetch here. It's a high energy site that's experiencing a lot of erosion. And we set it up as a demonstration project. Let's try this. Let's put this someplace where the only thing you're going to lose is a lot of cedar trees. So let's put this in a high energy site and see if it'll work. So with the help of um, folks at IMS, we established this uh, oyster reef and had some marsh plantings behind it. This picture was taken in 2012, shortly after it was established. And you can see we had deep water behind it. By 2013, we had a decreed sediments behind it. 2014, um, you can still see the sediment site is pretty high behind it. We lost a little bit of oysters there. And then I think Rachel went back out just a couple weeks ago and took this last picture. Again, you see this maintenance of sediment behind this reef. And again, we see the live oyster has colonized this site really well. And despite um, Hurricane Arthur and some other problems at this site, this oyster sill has maintained itself in this high energy setting and it's trapped sediments behind it. This is another way of looking at that. Um, I showed you earlier this idea of putting a benchmark in. So that's just the oyster sill. What about the sediments from behind the sill up to the tree line? So here we have, over the years, we've collected digital elevation models of this whole shoreline using this, this bike technique. So this is a DEM taken in 2012. This contour line here in red, you'll see through all these images, that's the minus 0.3 NAVD NE8 line. Here's the open water. You can see light green is the lower elevations, and then higher elevations are the white. So this is 2012. This is the subsequent years. So you can see not only do we, do we add sediment right behind it, but we maintain this whole thing. So here's that same line. Here's the reefs. Um, these pictures, I'm sorry we can't see, but this is the reef here. And you can see we added all this sediment behind the reef. We maintained our, el our surface elevation of the marsh behind it. This is 2014. Again, added sediment behind it. One thing that I want to show you here, and we need to talk about a little bit, we talk about some of the considerations of when you start putting anything hard, even if it's an oyster reef, and certainly if it's a stone sill, they don't attenuate wave energy. And one of the things you can see, if you could see these pictures you could see, is that we do have some erosion. Here's a gap between these two sills. I don't know if you can see it. Can you see there's a sill here? There's a sill here. There's a gap right here. And as you see, you go from here to here, and then here we're seeing a decrease in elevation as the water kind of shoots between that gap. So it's one thing you kind of have to think about. I think some of the folks later today are going to talk about design considerations of when you have that gap, you can have some, some refraction of, of wave energy. This is a map of the vegetation. This is the original vegetation that was there. Rachel did some, Rachel did some marsh plantings there. And you can see we've gained some marsh over time. We planted last summer about 10 days before Hurricane Arthur. We're going to try again this summer. Hopefully we don't gin up another hurricane on top of this. But again, you can see some of the erosion of the plants right in this gap. But again, you can also see we've had a real increase in plant um, and marsh uh, coverage over time. So even in this really kind of high energy, we don't know if this is going to work or not place, we've had some success. So to kind of give you the outward bounds of where an approach like this might, might work. Um, another example um, of how effective stone sills can be and how much sediment accretion you might get and some considerate considerations. This is a similar kind of idea. You take your bike, you collect a whole bunch of elevation points, you create a digital elevation model, you compare that digital elevation model through time. So that's what we're doing here to look at total volume of sediment associated with these sites. And in this case, the red is net gain and the blue is net loss. This is a site with a stone sill. This is a site you'll see today. And over three or four years, you can see we've had a dramatic increase in sediment accretion across the whole site. The nice thing about this is you're sampling the whole site this way. So we can really look at net sediment accretion. This is a natural marsh nearby where we've had some gains and losses, but an overall loss in sediment elevation in this particular marsh. So again, the effectiveness of this approach in accreting sediments. 
I will say again in terms of considerations and things to think about it, you know, sediment is good, we're keeping up with sea level rise, we're maintaining shoreline erosion, but at this site and a couple others, what you don't want to do is have so much sediment accretion that you end up with, I think one engineer used the term perched beach, so where you can actually accrete sediment up to the height of that sill, and then you start losing your marsh vegetation. And we've actually seen that at some of our sites where we've gone from low marsh to high marsh, and fish habitat kind of by definition is the it has to be flooded or it's not fish habitat. So there are some trade-offs here. We want to accrete sediment, we want to build sediment, but we don't want to make the, the stone structure, whatever you use, so high you accrete so much sediment behind it that you actually lose your inner tidal environment. So just some, some things to think about there because they can be very effective at accreting sediment. So I want to talk for a minute. We've mentioned um, sea level rise and trying to increase coastal resiliency. So this graph, uh, here just shows you sea level rise record. This is um, adapted from Kemp et al. 2009, so it's specific for North Carolina, using some salt marsh records going back about four or five hundred years here. And then this is the tide gauge records up on top. So we have had sea level rise for thousands of years. This is the more recent rate. And salt marshes do well under periods of sea level rise. Their feedback systems are such that they trap sediments. They have all this below ground biomass. So marshes are kind of well positioned to do well under periods of gradual sea level rise. These are the predicted levels. This is again from the recent uh, revised report. It wasn't really revised. <laughs> I think the overall conclusions are pretty much the same, but it was couched in a way that was more acceptable. So this is the low estimate um, relative sea level rise through the state. Um, from you know three to seven inches at the very least over the next 30 years and then this is kind of the high estimate and one thing i want to what i just uh, this just happened this weekend so it's not maybe five or six inches a lot but what what's happening is it's this nuisance flooding so this weekend they lost over 100 yards of highway 12. There wasn't a hurricane. There really was hardly a nor'easter. There was a full moon, and there was a really big tide, and there was offshore swell, and we lost a lot of the highway. And what's, what seems to be happening, and people are starting to realize, is this idea of nuisance flooding. So we're getting higher tides. The water's coming up higher more often, and it's getting up into the back of people's yards. It's getting up on the shoreline. The higher that water is, the more erosion you're going to have. So we want to have systems, ideally, that can keep up with that to some extent. And the good news is salt marshes and oyster reefs can keep up with sea level rise. You've got a built-in resiliency there with these systems. So this is just um, a schematic over here of how salt marshes, I mentioned kind of these positive feedback loops or how marshes are well conditioned to keep up with sea level rise. So that sea level, that the water comes in, the tide brings in sediments. We've already described marshes are really good at knocking down that wave energy and the sediments fall out and fall on the marsh surface. Marshes also have a tremendous amount of below ground production. You go out there and look at the above ground, it looks like a lot of plants. There's even more biomass below ground. So they also build sediment volume by all this below ground production. And this results in overall vertical accretion and net elevation change. There was a um, review recently, Don Cahoon of USGS recently had a review of uh, uh, wetlands worldwide looking at um, this data used using the, I mentioned the surface elevation change, so net surface elevation, table, net surface elevation change. And he found that of, of 89 marshes that had long-term records, 58% of salt marshes worldwide were adding elevation at a rate greater than sea level rise. So these systems are good at it. They can do it. And if they have adequate sediment supply is really the, the, the key. Similarly, there was a recent paper by Tony Rodriguez and his colleagues right over at um, IMS showing that North Carolina oyster reefs also do a really good job of keeping up with sea level rise and can gain elevation at centimeters per year, which is several times greater than sea level rise. So we have two systems here that have resiliency that can keep up with sea level rise and come be part of your shoreline stabilization approach. So another question, how long might it be before you see the benefits? This is a series of pictures, and we've got some other examples. Um, 
It, it takes a little while for that marsh to get established. Here's just the sill. Um, it, it really depends in part on how dense you put the plants. You know, the more plants, the denser you put them, the faster the recovery you're going to have. But certainly by almost by three years, you almost always by three years have got 100% cover. You might have to go back and replant. And by five years, by now you've got sediment accretion. You've got a really um, uh, solid, sustainable system that's going to go through storms. Although, as we showed you earlier, even right after planting, these, these systems are um, resilient to, uh, to uh, hurricanes and storms. So it does take a little while to get established depending on site conditions, but it can happen pretty quick. So I think I can wrap this up. I think I've said this. I think what we really need to think about and what we as scientists need to do is provide help in coming up with engineering guidelines to match projects to the physical setting of the site. As I've mentioned, here's this oyster marsh thing where we're not using rock. We're just using natural habitats across of wave energy settings from a very quiescent setting as we have here to the dread spoil island out on uh, Harker's Island, which is way out here, to the Nears demo project, which is also somewhere in here. So we're starting to get a feel for the wave energy settings at which these things can, can work. I want to mention there are some trade-offs. I've mentioned some of them previously um, about how uh, you know, trade-offs between, for example, building up sediment and getting a lot of plant biomass here. You've got plants moving all the way down across right to the rock. We've had a lot of sediment buildup, so the plants have moved down. So maybe that's good for shoreline stabilization. But what we lose in this kind of uh, configuration is we lose fish habitat. Putting the sills in as opposed to having an oyster reef or opposed to just having a mud flat uh, salt marsh continuum also is a loss of, of habitat for fish and other benthic creatures. So there are trade-offs here. You have to just adapt to site conditions. And so because of these trade-offs, we want to minimize the footprint of that stone sill. Build as much as you need. Don't build too much. And I'm not going to walk through these. You've got, um, you've got access to this talk online. Um, and so you can read these yourselves. But thank you very much for being here today. Really excited about it um, because we feel like this is the group we have to reach as scientists. You know, we write our papers and all that, but you guys, I think the people in this room can really help make this happen. Um, we're going to visit some of these sites today and look forward to it. Be happy to take any questions for myself or Rachel. And thank you very much. Come on. I'm Niels Lindquist, and the comment that I have is that the issue you were just talking about at the end with the backfill, with the sills, if they're above mean water level, you know, you will potentially get that increase. An oyster reef will top out at mean water level. They don't grow up above that height, right. so they're kind of self-limiting in that yes. respect. So. Correct. Mike, the mic. I have a question about. Is it on? Oh, okay. I have a question about the uh, the source of the sediment for um, that for the accretion in the marshes. Um, have you been able to determine is it coming in with the the, the tidal influx or is it from uh, the upland source? You're still getting some er erosion behind the sill. Uh, it. I've seen both, and it depends on the site. Um, I think that, for example, that Carrot Island site, there's that bluff behind it, and I think some of the, maybe Jones Island, Lexi might be an example of where that's the case, where the sediment that's coming onto the site is actually from the bluff behind the site. But we've got lots of other sites, Pinal Shores is a good example, e even right here, where it's clearly coming in on the tidal waters. So it really depends on the slope of the site and what's behind it. In those cases where you've established a sill and the marsh uh, grows up behind it pretty successfully, have you tried removing that sill to see what happens so you can get rid of that scour area? Nobody's done that that I'm aware of. Um, 
You know, the nice thing is the sills settle. <laughs> We're trying to track that, you know, and they can become colonized with oyster reefs, but that would be a big job because most of those sills are, are granite. It's a lot easier to add on top than it is to take it away, but I don't know of anyone who's removed the sill. But it's definitely, you, and you'll see that today, they, the plants grow right out to it, and it's like they're trying to climb over it. Just a correlated question on the last one. If you left the existing one there, the, the hardened surface, and then put another one in front, could you recreate the shallow water again? And is, is that, has that been thought about or tried? It hasn't been tried. Um, someone may have thought about it. So now we get into some of the regulatory issues. So now, you know. It's just politicians, you got to change their mind. <laughs> well, no, because I think, I mean, I, I think as long as you've got, so, so we've got a sill and you'll see this today. And offshore you've got subtidal, even maybe even a little bit of intertidal habitat, you know, that's okay. I don't know that we need to put another one out there. We're not really trying to grow the marsh out any further than it is. What we're really trying to do is just maintain that shoreline, you know, from the sill landward. So as long as we're maintaining that, I think we're satisfied and not really trying to reach out further into that shallow subtitle where there may be SAV, you know, and there's other kinds of habitat value of that. So we, I, don't, I don't really think that's something that we would do. Thanks. Um, I'm interested in kind of a specific site. Uh, it's on the Bay River in Pamlico County. Um, it is eroding. Uh, it has some riprap uh, revetment that's been in place. Um, uh, it's mostly wind tides. Mm -hmm. So is this an option uh, for restoring the shoreline? Uh, it, it, I'm, uh, it would be an option. So is, is it a bluff? Or I feel like bluffs are the hardest. I, I don't call it a bluff, but okay. it might be, yeah. So maybe, it's slope, maybe, it's, um, it's, and it's sharp, and it's maybe a foot or two. Yeah, I think it would be, I think it would be an approach. You're going to hear a lot more today, uh, and, and I think there's some folks that will show you some examples of some projects up in that part of the state. So I think this is definitely an option, um, and so... I, I think you'll probably see something later on during the day that's going to strike you and say, ah, yeah, that's the kind of thing that, it, that might work up there. Now, for the recording, I'm Clamorhead. Uh, this is a little bit from the scientific end of it. It, it appears from everything that we're saying and what you presented that going from uh, oyster reef built underwater to a seal that you're going to have different rates of growth that's going to catch up faster. And one of the things I've been concerned about is, have you done any studies or have you noticed anything on the different rates building up a layer of methane gas from decomposition? Like, you know, do the seals build up faster and you have more or less methane? Most of the, most of the, uh sites that I've worked on are pretty high salinity seawater, so we don't get methane. It's all sulfate reduction. So methane can be a problem in freshwater systems or very brackish, but in saltwater systems, you really don't get production of methane. The sulfate reducing bacteria do, do most of the decomposition. Okay, all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Not a question, but I uh, just wanted to get you, Carolyn, to um, show or, or talk about how they built the, or how they put the oysters there in, at the Carrot Island site. Okay. Um, so that was Joel Fodry. Um, we, we contracted with Joel Fodry, and, and were, were you there, Rachel? Rachel, you described the process. I've seen pictures, but I wasn't there. Yeah. 
Yeah, it was it was quite a, an undertaking. So um, if you go out Taylor's Creek, it's a relatively shallow area, but we brought in some barges, and then we actually built um, little makeshift barges on our skiffs, and we essentially dumped shell onto those boats, and then just drove right up to where we wanted to put the sill, and we shoveled it off. So lots of grad students, graduate and lots students of are labor. key to a lot of these projects. <laughs> it took us about I think a solid week and a half of just shoveling and more shoveling, but we that's how we built the sill. And we had pretty fine elevation measurements, so we had a very specific area that we knew the exact elevation, and then we built it um, to a very specific height um, all through, and then we had one long sill right along where Carolyn showed um, on one side of the site, and then one that was a little farther offshore, because we kind of wanted to see if you'd have differences in terms of protection, and we and we are seeing that. Yeah. So, so the um, the other way, so the other way that we've you know you've done oyster bags, and you'll probably talk about that later on the oyster bag approach. So here on the island, the way we got shell out is Division Marine Fisheries has a barge with a water cannon on it. It's my favorite way, and they just had piles of oyster shell on the barge and just you know drove them off with a with a water cannon water cannon. I think it's a great way to deliver. I'm sure you would have liked that. Cause that and actually, uh, let me just say in terms of you know, whole, you know, full disclosure, that was our second effort out there at Carrot Island. As I said, we knew it was a high energy site. We knew it was going to be tough. The first time, we did have Division Marine Fisheries come out there with a barge and a water cannon and just spray shell. And that was the year before Hurricane Irene. And so that effort failed. Um, we had a lot of erosion of that bank, Mike, from above. It came down, covered that oyster, just completely covered it. It got flattened, it got covered by the sand. And then so we came back um, a year later, built the big reef that IMS put in. Interesting, a year later, you know, shifting sands and erosion, our original reef has been uncovered and is now starting to uh, have some recruitment and have some oysters, but it's a very low structure. It's not the, it's not the sill. So, you know, we were able to do trial and error out there, but I think this, I think this sill thing where you really built it up and you had, I don't know to what degree did that rebar help hold things together, Rachel, do you, or was it just the wave energy just kind of consolidated it? Yeah, because it's really packed together. They put a lot of shell down and it got very compacted. I just have a, a comment about that oyster reef building that we've done through IMS and you know, we've been a part of that and a lot of that was funded by APNEP. So thank you Bill and um, Sea Grant as well for the funding to do those projects and uh, also the reserve. But you know, with the oyster reefs in these high salinity environments where you have high tides, you really, you know, high tide ranges, you've got to realize that the zone that oysters will grow in is basically from mean low water to mean water level. So you have to be you know, aware of that to really, I think, to have a, a good design if you want an oyster reef. And you can basically judge for any region what your opportunities are if you just look at a seawall and look at the, basically the width of the oyster zone on that vertical seawall. Yeah, oysters, oysters aren't going to work everywhere. That is for sure. Um, we have kind of an ideal setting here. But the last comment that Neil's made I think is really useful too. If you go out to a site and you're trying to figure out what's going to work there, look around and see what's nearby. See if there's marsh growing nearby. And the best way to figure out the elevations at which to put stuff is to survey what's down the, what's down the shoreline to where you are. Is there oyster there? If you don't see any oyster there on seawalls, if you don't see any oyster reef, then that's probably a reason why, you know? So use, use the surrounding area to kind of guide you as to what might work there. Having said that, we've put marsh in on sandy beaches, the marsh has done great. We've put oyster in on mud flat because we saw oyster nearby and it's done great. But that, that, it's a very good thing to do is just look around, see where you are, use the local distribution of plants and oysters in the inner tidal to guide how you might design your project at that particular site. One more comment about the bulkheads and sort of using those as a guide. With the newer plastic bulkhead materials, they really don't support oyster growth, so don't think if you don't see it on that type of material that oysters couldn't work for you in that area. Yeah.
Has there been any consideration for other types of um, materials other than like granite and stone and, and limestone and, um, and oyster bags for use as, as sills, uh, artificial concrete units, stuff like that? You know, we haven't, uh, you know, people have used uh, reef balls, I guess, kind of that kind of oyster domes that has been used. There's a lot of interest lately in the artificial concrete, the biogenic concrete. I think there's a lot of potential there. There's also other things. There's the core logs, which I think have been used in some places. I'm not familiar with them. Um, they would be, you know, so a fibrous coconut maybe. I don't know what it is, some kind of fiber that gets put at the marsh toe to provide probably a short time protection while the marsh gets established. Um, vertical breakwaters, just the wooden. Spencer, are you going to talk about some of this probably, I'm thinking? Yeah, I think a lot of these questions, um, Spencer and you're, you're going to see a lot of examples um, from Tracy and Lexi and Spencer and Steve later on of very specific, site-specific approaches to these things. So I think, you know, you'll, you'll see some of these later on. But yeah, there are a variety of other means. I've just kind of talked about what, the basic you know, what, what I know a little bit about. <laughs> I don't want to go too far <laughs> the other way.